morning congregation and um, I greet you on this second Sunday morning of, of January. As a call to worship this morning, I'm going to take a few verses from Psalm 84. The psalmist says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my God and my King, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Let us pray. We thank you this morning, God, for your great love and your blessing over our lives. We thank you that your favor has no end. It lasts our entire lifetime. We ask that you would forgive us for sometimes forgetting that you are intimately acquainted with all of our ways, that you know what concerns us. You cover us as with a shield. And sometimes we forget. We ask for your guidance so that we might walk fully in your blessing and your goodness this day. We ask that your face would shine upon us. We ask that you would open the right doors for our lives and for our loved ones, that you would close the wrong doors and protect us from those we need to walk away from. Gracious God, give us courage. Give us determination. Remind us this morning that you are always with us. We cannot hide from you. You know everything. Help us, Lord God, as we worship you today, to let go of bitterness and fear. We thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. And as we read your word this morning, we ask that you would remind us again that there's nothing that can separate us from your great love and that you know and you are working all things for good in our lives. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I want to read just a few verses from the book of Romans this morning, chapter 8, verses 26 to 30. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justifies. Those he justified, he also glorified. Called the, the sermon this morning, What Do We Know? What do we know? Paul wrote to the church in Rome, and we know that in all things God works for those, for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. This is a well known verse. It's a verse that Christians cling to, but it's also a verse that is extremely difficult to understand. Because for many, this verse is like rubbing salt into a wound. For others, the verse is a source of tremendous hope. There's some reassuring truths in this verse that I want to draw our attention to this morning. And so Paul writes, and we know. And we know. So what do we know? Well, Paul obviously knew something. And he wants to share that with us in these verses in Romans. And we know. Why is it important to know? Because knowing is a very important aspect in your life which helps you to acquire basic information and understanding of things around you. So you need to know a lot of things. For so long now, we seem to have not known anything for sure. What is COVID? What is Omicron? When is the next wave coming? just don't know anymore but here this morning we are told something we can know we are told something that we can be sure about 
And this phrase, to know, is repeated often in the book of Romans. In, Paul says in Romans 1 and verse 20 that you can know some things about God by looking at creation. In Romans 11 and verse 33, Paul says that you can know something of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And in Romans 8 verses 38 to 39, Paul says that you can know that nothing will ever come between you and the great love of God. Paul says that you and I can know beyond all doubt that every aspect of our lives is held securely in the hands of God. However, in verse 26 of Romans 8, Paul tells us something that we can't know. He says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So there are these two verses so close to each other, one about knowing and one about not knowing. And that's the difficult road that we walk on as Christians. While we can know that God is ultimately in control of our lives, we don't know the details of what he is up to in our lives. And in our day-to-day -day experience, we don't even know how to pray about our situation sometimes. So I know that God has my life in his hands, but I don't have all the little nitty-gritty details. And I actually know absolutely nothing about my future. So I have to believe with all my heart that while I can't see it, and sometimes it's confusing, and sometimes I don't even know how to pray about what's going on in life. God is in control, and that I can know. You need to think about this very seriously for a moment. Because there will come a day in your life when the only thing that is important for you is, what do you know? What do you know? Well, the Bible says we can know that God works, works all things together for the good of those according, those who love him, those who who love and live according to his plan. And the more you know, the more you know what he has communicated through his word, the better prepared you are for whatever happens in your life. Just consider Job for a moment, a man who feared God, a man who the Bible tells us was upright and blameless. And then he loses everything, all his possessions, his children, his health, and he didn't understand why did I have to suffer so much? And then he gets painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And his wife says to him, Job, just curse God and die. But Job stood firm in his faith. He stood firm. And even though he didn't understand all that God was doing, he still expressed his faith in the sovereignty of God. Job said this, but he knows the way that I take. When he tested me, I will come forth as gold. So Job knew something in the midst of difficulty. He knew his God. He said, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He said before that, he knows the way that I take. I know that my Redeemer lives. And then Job says, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not a and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job stood strong in the midst of being tested to the very core of his life because he knew his God in his own words. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. We can know. Secondly, we know that we start with God. Paul says, and we know that in all things, God, God works for the good of those who love him. So, so God is there at the beginning. God is there at the end. And God is there at every point in between in our lives. Because God is in all things. That's what Paul says. And we know that in all things, God. God is at work. Not luck, not chance, not blind fate. But in all things, God. God is there. And that we can know. And that answers the great and deep and burning question, where is God when it hurts? Well, if he's in all things, from beginning to end, then he's in the pain. Romans 8.28 reminds us that God was there before it all happened. He's there when it happened. 
and he will remain there when it's all over. Yes, there will be deep mysteries in life, unexplainable circumstances, deep pain and hurt. And the Bible does not ask us to pretend that our pain is not real. Paul is not saying that suffering and tragedy are good. Paul is not saying that everything will work out if only you have enough faith. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that in all of life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, in all of life, Paul is saying God works. It's almost like he's erecting a sign over the, the unexplainable mysteries of life, a sign that reads quiet. God is at work. And somehow that is what we have to believe with all our hearts, even when we cannot understand. We know God. And we know God works. God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We know that God is involved in everything. When the God of the universe says, I am for you, I am with you. I am working behind the scenes on your behalf quietly. God is at work. This is a, a definite promise this morning, and we know. This is a divine promise for us to hold on to that God is working. Little children are, are, can often be afraid at night. They're scared because they can't see in the darkness. They cry out until at last mommy or, or daddy comes and sits on the bed with them holding the little child in their arms and saying to them, don't be afraid. I'm right here with you. Somehow for that little child, the fear just goes away when, when mommy or daddy come. Even so, the darkness of, light, of life frightens us until we discover that our heavenly father is there. The darkness is still dark, but he is there. And that makes all the difference because he knows. Romans 8, 28 is not teaching us to, to smile through the tears and pretend that everything is okay. It's not doing that. But it is teaching us that no matter what happens to us, no matter how terrible, <coughs> no matter how unfair, our God is there. He's never left us. His purposes are, are being worked out as much in the darkness as they are in the light. So we can know, and we can know that God is working. Thirdly, there's this little word good that appears in this text. So what is meant by this word good? Romans 8, 28 tells us that God can use all things together for good. He doesn't say all things are good. He doesn't say that. <coughs> there's nothing good about cancer. There's nothing good about unemployment. There's nothing good about death. Until Jesus returns and conquers Satan once and for all, sin will continue to drag its poisonous tentacles across our world, damaging and destroying everything within its reach. God's good and our good are not the same thing. Our good is happiness and money, success and, and, and good health. God's good, God's good is very simple actually. It's to make us more like Jesus. And whatever it takes to make you more like Jesus, that's what God calls good. And it's a promise that he will work all things together for the good. That's what Romans says, in everything God works for the good. Let me say again, this verse does not say it's good if I get sick or something bad happens to me. But it does say that God uses these things and he weaves them together with every other facet of of my life in order to produce what he knows to be the very best for me and for you. God understands. God knows what's going on. He takes whatever happens in the world, he takes whatever happens in, in your lives, and he weaves it together for his plan, for his purpose, for his good, for his glory to make you, make you more like Jesus. <coughs> This is a dynamic, a dynamic promise that he's going to work all things together for good. And we know, says Paul, that in all things, God works for good. The phrase work together is really one word, synagogue in Greek, 
we get our English word synergy from it. <coughs> synergy is the, the working together of various elements to produce an effect <coughs> that is greater than and, and often completely different from the sum of each element that acts separately. Synergism so, so takes things, brings them together, creates something out of that, out of all these various different parts to form one whole. This is how it could happen. For example, maybe you're just making a stew. Put in the potatoes and some celery and carrots and onions and spices and meat and obviously a few of your own secret ingredients. And you cook that up and what comes out is a tasty stew. But maybe left to yourself, I think left to myself anyway, I wouldn't eat necessarily eat the celery or if I was going to put Brussels sprouts in there or something. I wouldn't just eat them on their own. But in the stew, they combine with all these other ingredients to produce something that is delicious and tasty and delightful. That's synergy. The combination of many elements to produce a positive result, a positive outcome. Let's take another example. Let's take salt. It's composed of of two poisons, I guess, sodium and chlorine. But when you put them together, you sprinkle them over everything you eat and just taste so much better. God causes the synergism to happen. He's the one stirring the mix. That's what Paul means in the scripture when he, said, when he says, God causes all things, all things to work together for his good. Many of the things that make no sense, no sense in life when seen in isolation, are in fact working together to produce something good in your life. It's a divine synergy we have to believe even in the darkest moments. A synergy that produces something positive. And the good, the good that is ultimately produced could not happen any other way. So God is working with all of your lives with every facet and part of your life, even those parts that you think serve no purpose, yet so over time something beautiful is being created. Not by accident, not by accident, but by divine design. Because just remember the sign, quiet, God is at work. So it is in the, in the providence of God that we learn actually, I think, often more in the darkness than we do in the light. Somehow we gain more from, from sickness than we do from health. We pray more when we are scared than when we are confident. And everything that happens to you, the tragedies, the unexplained circumstances, even the stupid choices sometimes that, that you make, all of it, all of it is being worked together. God is grinding it together for his loving purpose. And he will not give up even if you do. This, I think, is our greatest problem with Romans 8, 28. Our good, our good and God's good is not the same. And that's why sometimes the text is difficult. We want happiness and fulfillment and peace and long life. Me mean, meanwhile, God is at work in us and through us. And by everything that happens to us, working to transform us into the image of his son. So does that include the worst that happens to us? Yes. Does that include the things that hurt us deeply? Yes. Does that include the times when our hearts are broken? Yes. Does that include the times when we sin? Yes. Does that include the times when we doubt God? Yes. Because he is always, always at work and nothing happens outside of his control. There are no mistakes. There are no surprises. We know. We know. We know it because we know God, and that is what he said. And his word is trustworthy, and he guarantees it. We know it not by looking at the events of life, but by knowing our sovereign God. Yes, there are many things we don't know. Romans 8 referred to that already. We don't know why children die. We don't know why families break up. We don't know why good people get sick and suddenly we die. But this we know. Quiet. God is at work. 
he has not forgotten us. And so this is a promise, a definite, definite promise that we know. It's a divine promise that, that God works. It's a definitive promise that he works all things. And it's a dynamic promise that he's working all things for his good. There's a precondition that must be met before the promise, however, works for you. The verse says, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. First of all, this promise is for those who love God. And we as believers are described simply as those who love God. What a great name for us. We are God lovers. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9 says, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Paul also wrote to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 3, but whoever loves God is known by God. And James 1 and verse 12 said, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will rece receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Do you this morning belong to the religion of God lovers? The Bible says this verse, this promise, this wonderful encouragement, this motivation for the second Sunday of the new year is for those who love God. And so you are you a lover of God? Not just that you can say, I believe in God. Not, not just I'm a, I'm a believer of God. But are you a lover of God? We are called according to scripture. God has a purpose for our lives. God has called us to himself. And so at the, in, at the second, in the second Sunday of this new year, we're still at the very beginning of a new year. Ask yourself, can I truly be called a lover of God? Have I loved God with all my heart and all my soul? And if I haven't, I'm going to commit to doing that this year. Because the scripture today is about God working in our lives. Are you the one, one of the ones called by God? The scripture reminds us again this morning, God is active. God is involved. God is sovereign. God knows. God is good. Let us pray. Thank you that you are in all things, in every event in every circumstance, past, present, and future. Whether that be unbelievable suffering, hidden pain, private grief, times of joy and encouragement, you are in all things. In fact, in every possible situation, in every second of history, in every location, in this universe right now, Lord, you are working. You are in control. You are directing what is happening to make sure all things achieve your planned purpose, which is for the good of those who love you. So we thank you this morning that you are at work in all things and that you are at work for our good, which is quite simply to conform us to the likeness of your son, Jesus, to make us more like him until the day we are like him in the new heaven and the new earth. These things, Lord, we pray and ask in your name. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always.